Okay, everybody. I guess it's time to get started. Correct? So good morning. Um, settle down. Professor Fretzoli couldn't be here today. I don't know if he managed to give you a heads up or not. And uh, my name is Jacopo Tani. I am a senior researcher in his lab. And uh, I'm going to substitute for him today. I already uh, got notice from a couple of you that uh, I failed to upload the slides, but I guess I wasn't told about it. So you'll get the slides next time. Uh, for today, you'll just have to follow from the board. We're going to do um, a few passages by hand. So we're going to diverge a little bit from the slides. So it's good if you write things down. And, uh, and then you can compare with the results of the slides. And you will, you will see both ways. So this is a control systems one class. Um, it is my understanding that you have uh, um, already got a little bit into the meat of the interesting things of uh, uh, control systems for uh, linear time invariant systems. It is uh, uh, the core part of controls, even if everything seems a little uh, idealized, everything seems a little uh, away from reality. You see here things. Um, you will uh, learn that basically um, every time we have a, a real system, which could be um, Professor Fazzoli showed you the example of the car, probably now because he's a lot into autonomous driving. You'll see that real systems, when you go and describe their dynamics, you typically end up having something that is um, a nonlinear function of the state. I need to get used to this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is it good? OK, so when you go and try to do a control for something, you'll realize that whatever system you're dealing with, in a way or the other, can be modeled by most probably a nonlinear system, which is typically characterized by um, the dynamics of something that we called a state variable. And uh, you've got a nonlinear function of, uh, of the state, something that we call the input, and possibly something that is uh, a noise. And uh, a system is always characterized by the dynamics of the state that somehow represents um, the set of information that is necessary to describe uh, the behavior of the system at the next time step. States are typically uh, chosen in such a way that uh, everything there is to know about the history from uh, minus infinity time is, yes, sir. Is it interfering? I can press the magic out of focus button. It doesn't. Yeah. Say it again. So turn the out of focus off. Is that writing better? Thank you very much. So where were we? Uh, real systems typically have nonlinear dynamics, and they're characterized by an evolution of something that we describe with variable x, which is called a state variable. State variables are um, typically, there's infinite choices for state variables of a system, and uh, they typically have some dimension, which we call n. And they are uh, representative of, uh, uh, they, have, they contain sufficient information to describe what happens in the system at the next time step. They're chosen in, in, in this way. So you see that the dynamics of x is described by, of x dot is described by x. And, and then we choose something that we, that we uh, can measure, something that is an output. An output typically is always a nonlinear function, which is, of course, is different from the function of the dynamics of possibly the state and uh, maybe the input as well through a feed-through term and some other noise. Now, this is, in general, 
a very complicated way of representing stuff. Nonlinear systems can be anything. But, um, but you've seen that uh, they can be somehow linearized. All good? <laughs> Linearization is uh, uh, arguably your best friend from here to the next uh, uh, years that you'll be studying control systems. Um, learn how to linearize, learn how to love linearization. Uh, generally speaking, in control systems, there is a lot of stuff that is known for the uh, linear systems. Okay, you will see throughout this course that once you we arrived to we arrive to a form that is x dot equals a x plus b u, and y equals uh, c x plus d u, we can pretty much tell everything there is to know about the system. Okay, and. Uh, and what typically people like to do, especially mathematicians, is when they solve a problem uh, and they have their solution, when they move on to a next problem that they don't know the solution, the first thing they do is they try to just reconduce it back to what they know how to solve, right? So if we have a nonlinear system, we just linearize it, bring it back to what we have extensive literature for, and we uh, apply those terms. Of course, this is an approximation, but uh, um, you have to understand that every time that you start controlling something, the first step is always modeling, right? So modeling means uh, um, you maybe start from your understanding of the laws of physics, of the first principles, you write down the equilibrium of the forces, of the moments, or the kinematics, and stuff like that, and you come up with a description of something that is of interest to you. But models are somewhat arbitrary. Even if we try to describe the simplest of systems, I don't know, like a mass spring damper system that I'm sure you've seen a thousand times, there's lots of degrees of, of, of complication that we could get into, okay? Sometimes uh, you, you ignore the frictions, you ignore the, the stiffness, I don't know, the um, time-bearing phenomena that happen in the stiffness of the, of the, of the uh, spring. So my bottom line is that every time you make a, uh, a model, you are um, choosing what is important to you and what is not. So all models are wrong, fundamentally. But the point of models is not that of being accurate or that is describing ideally exactly what happens. But the point of models, of models is that of being useful to you, okay? So all models are wrong, but some of them are useful is the, is the bottom line. So when we linearize a nonlinear system, we're putting in approximations, but as long as we do it with care, and uh, um, it is my understanding that you know how to linearize a system, right? Once you're given uh, some nonlinear dynamics, you find an equilibrium point, and then you use Taylor to, to find the Taylor series to find a, a linear system you get this, this uh, set of uh, ordinary differential equations. And the idea is that you want to eventually get to a control system that allows you to do what, uh, allows you to control, to, to, to regulate the system to do something that you want it to do as opposed to how the natural dynamics would, would, would evolve. And, uh, and it turns out that if you want to, even after simplifying the description of our uh, dynamics in this linearized form, if we want to jump from here to here, so from the dynamics directly to a control system, it's really, it's really um, challenging, it's tough, it's a, it's a difficult problem. Instead, we've introduced this concept of uh, transfer functions. that allow us to describe the relationship between uh, inputs and outputs, especially when the input is uh, something like a, um, um, an exponential, with uh, s being uh, a complex number, then we see that the, um, the dynamics of the system can, re can be represented, uh, at least the steady state dynamics of the system, the output, what you observe, can be represented as uh, the multiplication of something, which we call the transfer function, times this exponential term. And uh, um, of course, this, this transfer function is uh, something that is, uh, is a function of s. We could um, look at the frequency response expressed as j omega, again, it's a complex number. And, uh, and it takes as an input an s, and it maps to um, uh, to some number that belongs to the complex plane. So thanks to this approach, we can relate in an easy way uh, inputs and outputs and characterize the behavior of the system in a more modular way. So um, 
We've, uh, uh, you've uh, been told something about transfer functions, how to obtain them. You've been told that uh, they can be expressed in different forms. Um, typically, the most, uh, let's say, famous ones are, let's say, a transfer function can always be expressed as, as a ratio of polynomials. So you can say, OK, there is a sum. Say it again. Oh, this is inconvenient. They can be expressed as a ratio of polynomials. So you have uh, um, some uh, uh, coefficients uh, uh, b at the numerator that multiply the, a polynomial of degree n in, in this, bn minus 1 times this, n minus 1, plus, 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 whatever, decreasing terms up to b0. And a similar thing happens at the denominator. I mean, this is not the only form in which you can express transfer functions. Sometimes you've seen that um, if you find what the roots of the denominator and the denominator are, um, you, you can express this, for example, as a, um, a product of a bunch of simpler terms. You put them in minimal form, so you've got like maybe s minus p1, s minus, times s minus p2, and so on. And similarly for the numerator. And you've been told that the roots of the denominator uh, are called poles of the system, while the roots of the numerator are called zeros of the system. Because if you choose s to be any one of the zeros, the transfer function actually is zero. And if you choose the um, s to be a, one of the, of the poles, fancy things happen, OK? But You've seen that this transfer function can even be equivalently represented as something that you've called partial fractions. So you can, um, you can decompose it somehow through some, some terms, uh, which we called residuals, over the sum of, uh, of, of the, the poles like this. So R2 over S minus P2, and so on. So you've seen that, uh, thanks to this expression, we can characterize the influence of the poles, which typically uh, really characterize the dynamics of the system. Because if we write the time domain response of the dynamics of the system, um, it turns out that it is a function of, uh, of uh, something that multiplies the, uh, some exponential terms, uh, which decay uh, as, as the different poles. So you've seen that if the poles have, actually this is a plus, if the poles have a negative real part, then you've been told that the system may behave in a, in a, in a stable way, right? So there's kind of different kinds of stability. If uh, probably you've been introduced to Lyapunov stability, which is something that says, okay, if you um, have some initial condition and your system has some properties, for example, the uh, poles have, uh, the real part of these poles are, have ne are negative or equal to zero, then the dynamics of the system will converge to some ball around your equilibrium point. Well, if the, uh, the, all the poles of the system are, um, are negative, then you see that this is financial term decays, so eventually your, your, your output uh, asymptotically uh, reaches some, some steady state point. And uh, so you've been told what poles and zeros are and, and how they influence the, the behavior of a system. And um, later on, you passed on uh, talking about uh, input-output stability of a closed-loop system. Now, so up to now, we uh, talked about having a input to a system, which we characterize um, by some control systems. We really like uh, simple stuff. Okay, we use blocks and everything. All the world is a block with inputs and outputs. So we'll start thinking in that way. If we say that the transfer function of the system is the sum, actually we call it G of S, um, then the input and the output uh, have some relationships which can be described by poles and zeros. But once you want to start making the output follow some, some reference signal that for some reason is important to you, um, you've seen that through a, a relatively simple but extremely powerful feedback mechanism, that is, you take the output and you compare it to the reference signal, by simply subtracting it, you obtain some, some tracking error signal, 
which you feed the to a block that you, we call a controller. And through this magic, we can, we can uh, uh, bring the output to follow the reference signal with, with some performance. And so up to now, we were talking just what happens if, if we look at this block here, right? Well, once you get into the closed loop scenario, you say, okay, look, the properties of this closed loop system of the whole behavior of the, uh, from taking as input the reference the signal as an output, the actual output of the system, which is at the end of the day, what our control engineer is interested in. No, like you have something, you say, I want it to be like this. And what you care about is what is, how the actual behavior of the system matches or not your, your desired reference, right? So we've seen that the properties of the system can be characterized by, um, by some, uh, some, uh, some, 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 some characteristic functions. The first one is what we called the, the loop gain, which is actually the open loop gain, which is, um, I think you used L as a, yeah which is a transfer function that is literally just the product of the transfer functions at the, on the open loop branch. So the open loop is always this, this um, the part of the system that neglects the, um, the feedback term, okay? So it's the, let's say the main, the main branch, so to speak. And it's the product of the transfer function of the controller times the one of the system. Let's, let's call now the system uh, a plant, which is the typical terminology. So this, I'll call it P of S times P of S. And you've seen that once you study, you know this term, um, it is possible actually to obtain uh, uh, information about the, the behavior of the closed loop system only, be, on, only considering this. And uh, to, to get this, uh, to, to formalize this idea, you've seen that there is something called a, a closed loop transfer function which is a transfer function that maps from the reference signal to the output of the system, and uh, which is sometimes even called the uh, complementary sensitivity function. Which is, uh, I think you used the term S, is uh, L of S over one plus L of S, which is a simpler way of saying C times P over one plus C P. Here, please pardon the fact that I will drop the notation of the S every time just for, 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 for economy of notation, but these are all functions of S, okay? And this function describes basically the behavior between uh, the input, the reference signal, sorry, to the uh, output of the system, okay? And, uh, and then you've been introduced to another function, which is called the sensitivity function. Which is, um, again, a function of the open loop gain. And it is one plus L of S, that is one over one plus the CP. And, better? And, um, and maybe something that um, wasn't, um, you, you weren't told to, I were like, so why in the world are we calling these function the transfer function? So how is of your preferred way? Like this? So, You've introduced, been introduced to these functions. You've been told that these functions have actually significance, meaning, um, and maybe it's curious to see why they're called like this. And um, so the sensitivity function, so typically when you hear the term sensitivity, it means uh, um, if I vary something, how much does something else vary, right? So um, say position of this computer on the, on the stand is very unsensitive to me touching it because if I vary the force that I put on the, on the screen, the position of the computer pretty much stays the same, right? If I instead took the mouse and I said, what's the sensitivity of the position of the mouse to an external force? Well, it's high because if I change the force, the, the, the position of the mouse actually changes. 
So what does it mean, a sensitivity for a closed loop system, right? So again, what you really care about uh, uh, at, as a final result is the relationship between the reference signal and the output. So you, um, and, and that, that is characterized by the function T of S, the complementary sensitivity function. And uh, if we ask ourselves, okay, say that I have a, um, a, 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 a controller for a system, we're all happy, and we've got this complementary transfer function that describes the behavior. And I want to ask myself, how much does this function vary if I vary a little bit the properties of the system? So if I designed a controller for a system and I shake a little bit of the plant, how much does it still work for the, for the problem that I was trying to solve before? And uh, this is um, basically the, taking the derivative in some sense of the, of the T of S, which you can still see, which is CP1 plus a CP, which is uh, 1 plus a CP square. At the numerator, we put the derivative of the numerator, and we're deriving with respect to P, so it's a C times the denominator not derived minus CP times the derivative of the numerator with respect to P, which is just C. So this is a complicated way of saying C plus C squared P minus C squared P over one plus a CP square. This and this goes away, and you can see that it can be expressed as one plus C time over one plus a CP times one over one plus a CP. And this is the sensitivity function that we saw here. So this is C over one plus a CP times the sensitivity function. And uh, if we look a little bit better at this term, we can see that C can you still see here? C one plus the CP can be, um, we can just multiply and divide by the same quantity, and we get CP one plus the CP times one over P, which is a complicated way of saying the complementary transfer function over P. So this here becomes the variation of the closed loop transfer function over the variation of the system becomes uh, T over P times the sensitivity function. So you might remember that if you take, uh, let's say you have a certain function and you take the derivative. Now let's just forget about what we said until now. You have a function, you take a derivative, you have the derivative of the function. And here we're supposing we're taking the derivative with respect to X. Okay, now if you have the derivative of the logarithm of a function, this is one over f of x times the derivative of the function inside, okay? So just to, um, so I'm doing these passages to understand what is the definition of s, why is it called like this, right? So let's try to get rid of this stuff, these, this term here. And the way we do it, we say, okay, let's instead take the derivative of the logarithm of t of s over the logarithm of p, yes, sir. Better? The derivative. I've got like laser markers here and I'm working towards the edge, but apparently. Okay, so what were we saying? If we do this calculation, what we get is exactly the same thing as before, but one over T times P times DTS over DP, which is P over T times T over PS, where this, plate, this term here comes from here. So these happily go away, and we see that we've got now something that, that defines the transfer function. Okay, so, so this the sensitivity function. So what, what is the sensitivity function? Sensitivity function is a measure of, uh, of how uh, much your uh, closed loop transfer function varies if you change the parameters of the system a little bit, which, which is something that um, as, you, as, you, as you go along, you will see that is very, very important. And uh, so at least we understood why this is called sensitivity function. And uh, the next question is why the other one is called complementary sensitivity function. Well, simply because if you take T of S plus S of S, this is equal to one for all S. Okay, so T of S is just the complement of, of the sensitivity function from which the name comes from. Okay, so 
Let's get back to. Yes, ma'am. So the complementary sensitivity function describes the relationship between the reference system and the output. Uh, you, you shouldn't have it written, right? Between the reference system and the output. So it's the closed loop transfer function. It's very important. It's basically the single most important. I mean, it is a very important function in. The sensitivity function. Um, I don't want to give you a spoiler, but it will come in a, in, in a few lessons ahead. The bottom line idea is uh, uh, that, let's say, when you design a controller, okay, you have a system and you want to, and you want to design some, some, some logic, some controller, to, to do what? So what's the objective of a control system, right? Like now we're studying all the properties, we're getting uh, knee deep in the math and stuff, but, but what's the, the bigger picture? Every time you have a system, you really want to achieve three objectives. The first one is please don't make it blow up, okay? And that's the concept of stability. Uh, there is uh, input to state or state to output or input to output stability. The idea is you want the, um, if you have this, you, you, you are introduced to the concept of bounded input, bounded output stability, right? So if I send inside a signal, inside a system, a signal of finite energy, I don't take a super node and just slam it inside my uh, pendulum because that's not going to work. Um, you will get an output that has finite energy. You have bounded input, you get bounded output, okay? And that's like the basics. So this does not guarantee that your system actually works in any good way, okay? Uh, the stability is defined by time that goes to infinity. So try to imagine you're driving a car. Yes, the steering is stable. It means when you move the wheel uh, in infinite time, you might get to the lane, okay? That doesn't work out. So the second step when you design a controller is that of uh, wanting to achieve some sort of performance, right? You want your output to track your reference with some specifications, like fast enough or well enough without some errors, okay? So you will see in the next classes that, that uh, there's lots of attention to, okay, how, how, how do we satisfy some performance criteria? And then the third and final, and I'd say the most maybe challenging part of designing a controller is that the concept of robustness. And the concept of robustness means that, say I designed, so it, it, it goes back to the, uh, thing I was saying before about models, right? When you make a model of the system, you're trying to describe something that makes sense to you, okay? By no way in the world you're able to describe what actually happens in nature. So you're always making some mistakes. So you design a controller based on a knowledge that somehow you know it's flawed, okay? It's a, it's a sufficient description to, for, for whatever your purposes are, but it's, 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 it's an approximation. So say you have your controller designed for some plant, for a model of the plant that you had, but say that for any reason you, your plant your model wasn't actually right. You ignored a specific term, or, uh, or, you, or the, the terms of this, of this plant change in time. You know, even take like a door, the simplest of, of, of autonomous systems. You have a spring on top, every time you leave the door, it oscillates back to, to the closed position, right? I mean, do it for 10 years. After a while, the properties of the spring change. I mean, it's not gonna be the same K as, the, as in day one. So the idea of robustness is, uh, if I design a controller for a nominal plant, but that plant changes in time, has some bounded variation. Will my original controller still work? To what degree, okay? So it's a way to, to, to characterize uncertainty. I'm not really sure of what's going on, but I need to start somewhere. So the thing I wrote down, does it still up to what level of uncertainty does it work, okay? So the sensitivity function describes exactly this. This is a long answer for your question, but the sensitivity function describes the relationship between, as we see, how much do I need to vary my plant in order for the transfer function that I designed originally to still work, right? So typically robustness, somebody comes to you and says, you have to make sure that you are plus minus 20% of your model uncertainty is covered, so you use your sensitivity function to, to, to attenuate whatever you have to, I mean, to design it according to specs. You'll see this later on. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Maybe a little bit too. <laughs> uh, let's go back. Okay, so yeah, we're still on slide one, and uh, so you might have seen that in, in all these details as we go forward, there's, there's lots of rules, right? And there's lots of, 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 of details here and there you have to remember properties. Don't, don't worry, just keep calm, follow the rules, and things are going to be fine. So again, we said now that we nailed down the concept of transfer functions, we're saying, okay, but 
what if we want to, um, so this transfer function is, 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 is a function in the complex plane, right? And it characterizes the behavior of our system. So how do we leverage the knowledge of the open loop transfer function to, to characterize the closed loop response? And there's uh, three different ways, one of which you studied, I think, at last class. One is called the root locus. So the root locus just says, okay, let's just take the knowledge of the open loop. Let's pretend the controller is just a simple gain. And, uh, and, and you can tell the, the place of where, how the poles of the closed loop system change now. So you've seen that, uh, for example, um, how non-minimum phase zeros are actually trouble because, because the dynamics of the system as you crank up the gain tends to those poles. And if they go to the um, uh, right-hand side plane, that is, if they have a positive real uh, part, you get into trouble because the system is unstable. And there's something called the Nyquist plot that is arguably the most uh, uh, convoluted, complicated, or at least my least preferred way of representing this, this, this complex function. That is basically a polar plot of the, of the transfer function where, where the uh, omega is considered implicit. And uh, Nyquist plots are really uh, nice because they're, they're, they can be used for any kind of complexity of system and they're very good in quantifying uncertainty. And then there's Boda plots. So when you have, a, 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 um, again, a complex function, you know that this complex function uh, typically is characterized by a real and an imaginary part. Like every complex number has a real and an imaginary part, by definition. And uh, so Bode plots simply analyze the two parts independently. They don't really look at real and imaginary part, but they look more at magnitude and phase, okay, which are direct functions of the, of, the, of course, um, but we'll see it in a, in a little. So, Boda plots are, um, have to be used with caution, as we will see today, but they are really easy to draw and, uh, and uh, they give significant insight. So we will, we will study these Boda plots today. So let's, we talked about this already, but let's remember that the definition of a transfer function is uh, how does your steady state uh, system respond to an exponential input? And in particular, we've seen that if we choose this exponential input such that um, the real part is a sinusoid or a cosinusoid, whatever it's called, then the system replies in the same way at steady state. This is a really important, a really important point. If you have a linear time invariant system and you start uh, exciting it with an oscillatory uh, with a sinusoid uh, uh, input at a specific frequency, and you wait long enough, the system output you're guaranteed will respond with a sinusoid. The only thing that changes is how the amplitude of the sinusoid and the, and the phase. Okay, so there's going to be a delay with respect to your input and there's going to be smaller or bigger. And these two terms uh, that are represented by the, um, the, 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 the magnitude of the transfer function and the phase of the transfer function are uh, exactly what the Bode plots uh, study. Okay, so the whole story about Bode plots is um, what, how does the transfer function of a system change at different frequencies, okay? How do we figure it out? How do we plot it out? And uh, you can see, for example, that if you have a, uh, an input system that is the, the green line, the one that goes, starts from one, that is constant all the time, then the output of the system, given sufficient time, uh, you've seen some time ago, maybe at the very beginning, that the output of, uh, of, of, a, of a linear time invariant system when expressed in time has two components. One is the a function of the initial conditions, and which we called the, uh, I think, the initial condition part, and the other one is the forced response, right, which depends on the input of the system. So if you wait long enough, given any initial condition, and the system is asymptotically stable, the transient part will go away, the initial condition part will go away, and here it's represented, in fact, by this, this blue line that you see it takes a while before it gets a steady state. No? And, uh, but eventually, you'll see that the answer, the, the output, is exactly the same thing as the input, only that it has a different magnitude and some delay. So if, in, uh, um, if we were able to display, to, to map this transfer function magnitudes and phases at every single point, we would be in game, right? Because we could characterize the input output response of a system for every um, sinusoid. And one would say, okay, why in the world do we care about sinusoids, right? Because there is a guy that told us that uh, under some conditions, which are pretty broad, pretty much any signal in the world can be, can be represented by an infinite sum of, of sinusoids, okay? So, so with the due approximations, if you know the transfer function <clears throat> sorry, of a system, you can calculate the response to any input, not only sinusoids. So 
as we mentioned before, we have to know the plots. What they really do is not look at just their real and imaginary parts, but the magnitudes and phases. So, so let's see how we can uh, how we can write this down. Maybe, maybe let's just read. So let's maybe write it down. It's better. Let's see how this works. It's good enough. So we got that the objective is characterizing magnitude and phase of this transfer function. And they're two different functions, so we describe them with two different plots. Is it normal? OK. So what was I saying? So yeah, we want to find out the magnitude of the transfer function. Can you read down there? Small? Whatever. And, uh, and we put this on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we put the frequency, okay? And this is the plot for the magnitude, and then you'll have another plot for the phase of the transfer function always as a function of omega. And here it's important that you pay a little bit of attention because there is some uh, details that, that matter. We express uh, the frequencies on a logarithmic scale. This means that you typically start, you, you, you express it in decades, okay? You say, ah, this is my zero point, 10 at the zero, then you say this is 10 at the one, 10 at the two, and so on. This is 10 at the minus one, 10 at the minus two, and so on. Keep in mind that frequencies are always positive. There is no concept of negative frequency. And the uh, y-axis, the magnitude of the transfer function, we represent it with something that are called decibels. Uh, have you guys ever been introduced to decibels? Raise of hands. No, yes, maybe, not enough. So uh, decibels are just a way to, to, to express huge numbers with, uh, with more convenient notations. So say you have a, a, a number that you want to express in uh, decibels. It could be anything. For example, the magnitude of the transfer function. It is simply given by 20 times the logarithm in base 10 of the same thing expressed in linear coordinates. Okay, and it's not coordinates, but in, in, in a linear way. So uh, in the opposite sense, of course, if you, want, if you have the dBs and you want to express the linear part, then this is clearly just the, the, um, the, the 10 to the x dB over 20. So the y-axis is represent, the magnitude is actually represented in decibels, and the scale is linear though, okay? So you've got zero to one, two, three, whatever it is, normal, okay? Well, the phase is typically just measured in radians or degrees, so it doesn't really matter, okay? So why do we choose this thing about decibels? Well, because as we've seen before, the transfer functions can be typically represented by uh, a bunch of products of terms at numerator and denominator. And when you play around with logarithms, products become sums. Divisions become subtractions. So if you have a very complicated transfer function that can be an arbitrary number of terms one after the other multiplied to divided, which are all the zeros on all the poles of the system, well, we can just analyze the behavior of each one of these terms and then obtain the global final result as a sum and subtraction of the simpler terms. And that's the idea of the whole trend of the whole Bode plots, the reason for which we use the, uh, the, the, the decibels. Can I have the thing back? Thank you. And, uh, and it's basically what guides the rest of the class today. So what we're going to do today is uh, analyze the different terms. And uh, the bottom line idea is if you send a bunch of these uh, signals, then you get enough data points of your transfer function. And at some point, you can, uh, you can uh, claim that you know sufficient amount of information uh, of data points of the transfer function. And you can maybe fit a model and reconstruct or and obtain an analytical description in practical terms. So let's go back to the document, Cam. So 
Now, what's the objective? We are more or less convinced that transfer functions are important, and then they can be decomposed in products of simpler terms that have meanings, zeros and poles. So we've got a transfer function, and say that this transfer function is, uh, now I don't want to use a, I will use a notation that is a little bit wrong, but at least it's not overly complicated, as long as we understand each other. Let's say it's, it's a bunch of products of polynomial, uh, numerator one, numerator two, up to numerator n of s, and the denominator term is again a bunch of products of functions, okay? And any one of these numerator of denominator at the end of the day can be one of four situations. It could be either a constant value. So let's put a constant in front of here. So something like a k. Or it can be, um, let's say a, a monomial term, is that correct in English? It's basically, you've seen like uh, differentiators, integrators, right? So terms that are basically S or one over S. Then we can have binomial terms, which is something like one plus tau S or one over one plus tau S, depending if it's at the numerator or denominator, or you'll have something a little bit more complicated, which, and this typically represents either having a stable pole or a, or a zero, right? This represents a differentiator and an integrator. This represents just a multiplicative constant, like a gain. And finally, you've seen that sometimes you have these complex conjugate uh, uh, poles of a system, right? So um, those are typically the solutions of a, a trinomial term, something that we can express as x square over omega n square plus 2c omega over omega n plus 1. So. Before we proceed, a word of caution. Um, when you'll get to the end of this class, you'll realize that making Bode plots is relatively simple. It's a very linear process. Once we, we, we figure out how these four terms work, you know everything you need to know. You just need to have a lot of patience and have a good hand in drawing, basically. Um, but the, the, the main failure mode, like the things students always get wrong in the exams, like it's the reason for, 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 for terror and tragedy, is the fact that the the transfer function has, be, has to be put in the right form before starting to process it, okay? And, uh, and it means all your terms in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the minimal, let's say, in this representation of the transfer function have to be represented like this. So if, for example, say you are given something like uh, S minus uh, P at the denominator, okay? This is not a good form for the Bode plots. What you would do is you would just uh, gather the P out and say this is one over P S minus one. Okay, now this becomes a constant gain and this other term is in the right uh, form. So make sure every time you do Bode plots, the first thing you do, you're giving a transfer function, you, may, you put it in Bode form, okay, which is all the terms have to be in this, in this shape. So do you have any questions? Feel free to interrupt me at any time if uh, I'm... So let's quickly do the, uh, the constant term just to give you a, a taste of how this thing works. Then we'll go on break. The break starts at 11, right? Yeah? I'm new to ETH. I've been here only two months, so you have to tell me these details. I'm, I'm not practical. I could keep you going if you don't stop me. Okay, so, so what's the objective now? We want to look each, at each one of these terms and understand as a function of their, of their parameters, what is the magnitude, what is the phase? So, just one other step back. Each one of these things, of course, S, imagine S always to be J omega, okay? It's a complex number. So we're dealing with complex numbers. A complex number in general, let's call it Z, is a sum of a real uh, plus imaginary part. If we want to write it a little bit more formally, it's the real part of Z plus J, the imaginary part of Z, okay? So what is the magnitude of Z? which is represented like this. It's the root of what? Of the real part square plus the imaginary part square. While the phase of Z is given by the arctangent of the imaginary part over the real part. Okay, keep this in mind because this is basically the same the tool we're use we're gonna use to 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 derive all these 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 terms. Anyways, we can do it in the next hour. Okay.
please uh, take a seat, settle down. So one correction, uh, I've been pointed out during the break that uh, um, in order for this to be a little bit more meaningful and match the, uh, the, 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 the terms that I have described, you, excuse me, you want to take out not just P but minus P. Okay, so this becomes plus one and this is minus one over P, then this is directly one of this term here. It's a one plus tau S where tau is equal to minus one over p, okay? Just, um, okay, so back in the game, what do we wanna do now? We want to analyze the magnitude and phase of each one of these terms. So let's start from the easy one, the constant. So the constant term, k. Uh, what is the magnitude? So. Let's do it like this. Um, magnitudes and phases are a function of real and imaginary part, right? So let's spell out what's the real and imaginary part for every case. Now, this is the trivial one. It's, uh, it's useful to get us uh, uh, rolling, but, uh, but later on it's gonna be useful. So what's the real part of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a K? <laughs> the real part of K is K, right? And because we're assuming K is real. What's the imaginary part of K? The imaginary part of K is zero, okay? So what's the magnitude of k expressed in dBs? It's 20 times the logarithm in base 10 of what? Of the magnitude of k. But the magnitude of k is equal to the root square of the, sorry, the root of the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part, which is a terribly complicated way of saying k, okay? So basically, um, the simple, Ma the, of course, this is not surprising, but if you do the magnitude phase in, sorry, the magnitude plot in dBs of your transfer function when you have, sorry, when you have a, a constant term, the magnitude is gonna be the value of k in dBs, okay? Constant over all frequencies. Let's look at the phase. The phase instead of k is gonna be the arc, the arc tangent of, uh, of the imaginary part over the real part. So it's what? It's uh, the imaginary part is a zero, the real part is k. So what does this mean? What's the angle? If you have a tangent that is at zero, if the uh, k is a positive number, then you can say this is, is the phase delay is, uh, this is the phase of j omega. If k is positive, then you have zero. If k instead of negative, then you have to take this other angle here and it's minus pi. So it's either zero across all frequencies when k is bigger than zero, or it's minus pi if it, k is smaller than zero. So oh, this one was easy. Now, let's do like this. We wanna keep this part up. Let's look at the second term. The second term is an integrator or a differentiator, okay? Let's just do uh, the integrator part. Sorry, the differentiator part because it's, it's relatively straightforward. So one thing that you might have uh, figured out by now is that when we play with uh, logarithms, multiplications become additions, divisions become subtractions. So uh, if we find the Bode plot of S, then if we want to find the Bode plot of the inverse of S, let's say the division by S, you just need to put a minus in front of it. Okay, so when we put these things together, because we will see that the Bode plot of one over S is just the Bode plot of S with a minus in front of it, both at magnitudes and phases. So let's look at S. So what's the first thing we do? The first thing we do is we say, okay, uh, this is, the, our, let's suppose our transfer function is G of S equals to S. We wanna look at G of J omega, which is j omega, right? So what's the real part of, j, uh, of, of, of this? The real part here is zero. What's the imaginary part? Well, the imaginary part is omega, right? So 
um, let's go and see what the magnitude and phases are. The magnitude of G of J omega, oops, is equal to the root of the square of the sum of the squares, which is omega square plus zero square, which is omega, okay? If we want to express this in dBs, what we get is uh, uh, the magnitude of G in dBs is 20 log 10 of omega, okay? So this is a It's a line in this Bode plot because the y-axis, as we said before, is linear, that uh, when omega is equal to, so here we have to sort of, because it's like the second biggest failure mode of, of students doing the uh, Bode plots. This is a logarithm, okay? When you say omega is equal to zero, you're saying omega is equal to zero, the linear omega, okay? So if if you remember the plot of a logarithm of some function, this as a function of x, the logarithm does something like this, okay? And this point here is one zero. So if your omega is at this point here, where omega is 10 to the power zero, which is an ugly way of saying one, then your dB value is actually zero, okay? So this is zero. So when omega is equal to one, it passes here and then it increases. Let's say now I take omega that is equal to 10 to the power 2, okay? We're down here. Well, uh, logarithms are really nice for playing with big numbers because if you have exponents at the argument of the logarithm, they become multiplicative terms, right? So this becomes 2 times 20 log 10 of omega. So the point is that this is a line that for every decade, we call these intervals between the powers of uh, omega decades, for every decade, it gains 20 dBs. This is 20, this is 40, and so on. They get something like this, okay? The phase instead, When uh, is what? Is the arc tangent again, let's write it like this, of what? Of uh, the imaginary part over the real part. So it's omega over zero. So what does this mean? It means that we have a looking for something, the, this, when the um, denominator of this goes towards zero, of course, we're never going to get to zero, where we're doing a limit for, for omega that tends to. Uh, to uh, zero from the plus side, we get uh, an infinite tangent, which is uh, uh, the angle is pi half. So you get um, this equal to pi half. So the phase plot is going to look something. It's going to be constant at all frequency at the value pi half. This is for S, okay? If instead we were looking at 1 over s, so let's say this is for s. If instead we were looking at 1 over s, you would just put a minus in front of it. So you would get this, and you would get minus pi half. Okay? Now things start to become a little bit more interesting. Say that we want to look at the, um, what's the next term? The next term is 1 plus tau s, okay? So this is our g of s. We want to look at the g of j omega, which is 1 plus uh, j omega tau. Okay, now the imaginary part of, sorry, the real part of this is what? The real part of this is one. The imaginary part of this is what? Is uh, omega tau, right? So let's write our plots here. This is the magnitude in dBs. 
this is the phase. Okay, so, so what do we wanna do? We wanna look at what the magnitude is, same old game. Uh, the magnitude is the square of the, um, it's the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary part. So it's one square, which is one, plus omega square, tau square. And the phase is instead the, the arctangent of what? Of the imaginary part, omega tau, over the real part, which is one. Now, in order to understand a little bit how this thing uh, uh, behaves, we have to, uh, it's useful to look at limit cases, okay? So let's say what happens if uh, uh, omega is uh, um, much, much smaller than one over the um, absolute value of tau, okay? Now we have not said yet if tau is positive or negative, so let's just assume it's, uh, let's take the, the absolute value. And um, so what does this mean? This means that uh, omega times tau is much smaller than one, right? So the magnitude in this case becomes, uh, uh, can be approximated, so since this part now is much smaller than one, is negligible with respect to one, so this becomes one in linear, okay? And the linear, so again, we remember the, um, remember the logarithm plot, this guy here is one zero, uh, the um, magnitude in dBs is gonna be 20 log 10 of one, which is again, in dBs, zero, okay? So here we said the omega is much smaller than one over tau, okay? What does much smaller mean? Uh, much smaller, we can assume for now that is uh, one decade smaller, okay? One order of magnitude smaller, which is a good enough assumption. So let's say that uh, one over tau is, uh, uh, is here. This will be uh, 10 minus one over tau, and this will be um, 10 over tau. Then we see that if omega is much smaller, the magnitude will go to zero. So let's say all values up to this guy here are, um, uh, are equal to zero. Then uh, let's look at the phase. The phase of g of j omega is this thing here, okay? So what happens if uh, omega tau is very small, well, this will tend to zero, right? So what's the arc tangent of something that is going to zero? Well, it's a zero. So the phase will start at zero as well. Now, let's look instead what happens if we have the other limit case. So the other limit case is we're going towards infinity now. So we're trying to, to, to bound these, the behavior of these guys first at the very low frequencies, then at the very high frequencies, and then in the middle we'll do some approximation. And, uh, and then we'll discuss what's the degree of this approximation. So what if omega is much bigger now than uh, one over tau, which means that omega tau is much bigger than one? Well, then, uh, uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to see what happens basically one decade after now the, 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 I think it's called breakaway frequency, time constant. So, okay, what happens in this situation? What happens is that um, the magnitude is, in this case now, can you see this? In this case, omega tau is much bigger than one, so we can neglect this term here. And this becomes, uh, if we express it in dBs, becomes 20 times the logarithm in base 10 of omega uh, tau, which is uh, 20 logarithm in base 10 of tau plus 20 logarithm base 10 of omega. So this is a line that um, uh, goes at a, has an, ang uh, an angular coefficient of 20 dBs per decade. So it means that after here, we'll tend to go uh, up here somewhere. And we'll see later how this goes. And the, the phase instead is uh, um, the phase of, of G of J omega is the arc tangent 
we have to look, so let me rewrite it. This was omega tau over one, when this is very big, okay? Much bigger than one. So this is very big, means that we're looking at tangents that go where? Very big, what does it mean? It could be plus infinity, minus infinity, right? So it depends on the sign of tau now. So if tau is bigger than zero, this goes, we can imagine this can be approximated as infinity, so the angle goes towards pi half, this one here. While in the opposite case, if tau is smaller than zero, we're going down in this direction, so the angle tends to become minus pi half. So the phase is uh, when we are at an approximation of being much bigger, so uh, at least a decade Afterwards, it will be this value here is going to be pi half. And we can approximate it like this. And it's the, this is the case for tau being bigger than zero. Instead, if we had a tau smaller than zero, it would go to minus pi half down here. So the phase would be like this. And uh, the magnitude, instead, we said it's a line. So we can, a line that passes through 1 over tau. So we can imagine it to be like this. This is a really brutal approximation. What really happens, and we could actually evaluate this by uh, looking at the case in which, um, in which uh, omega is actually equal to 1 over tau, you would get the real behavior would be something more looking like this which after here and here, we get pretty good behaviors as we describe them with this approximation. But in the middle, you get a, 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 a different. Ooh. Here. So what I'm saying is that in, uh, within here, so uh, when omega is much smaller, at least a decade smaller, you get good approximation. A decade bigger, you get good approximation. In the middle, your real behavior is going to be a little bit distance, distant from this uh, simplified thing that we're doing. But the maximum error is going to be here, and it can be quantified to be 3 dBs. It's not really important. The only thing that is important is that uh, we are studying approximations of ways of writing the Boda plots. But uh, for all means and purposes, for preliminary designs, they are sufficient. But then if you just want to have the exact uh, plotting of the Boda plot, just go use MATLAB, because it's, it's, it's easier. And we'll actually see some of uh, this stuff. So, OK, so let's see. Mm. So this is, uh, of course, if, let me go back to, so what we just described is when you have a monomial term, 1 plus tau s, right? Now what if instead you have it at the denominator, for example, instead of the numerator? So you have the term 1 over 1 plus tau s, it represents a pole instead of a zero. Well, it's just the inverse. So the, uh, the Boda plots you would obtain are exactly the same as the ones I showed, but you have to put a minus in front of them. So the magnitude would be flipped with respect to symmetric with respect to the real axis for the omega axis, the um, x-axis. And uh, the phase would be, again, flipped symmetric with respect to the horizontal axis. Of course, depending on the sign of tau, that would then mean one of the two cases. Now there is the uh, funnier uh, part, which is uh, arguably the only slightly more complicated uh, term in the Boda plots which is the one related to when you have, um, when you have uh, complex conjugate zeros or poles. Okay, so when you try to simplify your expression of the transfer function, you won't be able to reduce it to a simpler form than the uh, square, um, the second order polynomial. So you end up having something that if you, once you put it in the correct Bode form, looks like uh, s square over omega n square plus 2 zeta omega n plus s over omega n, apologies, plus 1. So here, um, the omega n and zeta are values, real numbers. 
uh, you can imagine them as if it were a resonant frequency, a natural frequency, and a damping coefficient, okay? Um, even if they don't necessarily have to have this physical meaning, but it's, 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 it's customary when you have second order things to, to call them like this. So what do we want to do? Now we want to analyze what again is their, um, what again is their behavior in terms of magnitude and phase. So this is, as for all terms, what we're doing is first we express the, first we express the, this is really ugly though, huh? Doesn't get any better, okay. We start from the G of S, next step. Uh, it's very structured the way you do these things. So it might seem a lot of information, but at the end of the day, it's the same four steps in a row. G of S, you go to G of J omega, which is, uh, you just plug J omega in, so you get J omega square over omega n square plus two zeta J, let's say omega over omega n J plus one, so, Who's the real part? And who's the imaginary part? Well, the real part now is this and this. So it's so this is re-expressible as j square, which is, so you remember, of course, that j is the root of minus one. So j square is equal to minus one. So this is minus, it's omega square over omega n square. I will just rewrite it plus one like this, plus, to zeta omega over omega n uh, j. So our real part now becomes this term here, which is one minus omega square over omega n square. And the imaginary part is of course the coefficient here. This is real and this is the imaginary part. So it's two zeta omega over omega n. So what's the next step? Well, now that we've got our real imaginary parts, we wanna look at magnitudes and phases. So what's the magnitude of this term? The magnitude of this term is the root of the sum of the squares. So it's the root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary part. So it's one minus omega square over omega n square, square, plus the imaginary part, which is this square, which is four zeta square omega square over omega n square. Let me put this two upright and close this thing appropriately. Okay, so, at this point, what do we want to do? We want to try to, I don't know, let's write the phase as well. The phase, this is, I'm getting lazy and I don't write all the terms correctly, but this would be G of J omega, and this is the phase of G of J omega. What's the phase? Is the tangent, our tangent of what? Of the imaginary part over the real part. So it's, uh, the imaginary part is two, zeta omega over omega n over one minus omega over omega n square, okay? Now, what do we wanna do? Um, we want to be able to, um, we want to describe, uh, the behavior of this thing in, a, in, a, in, a, in an approximated easy way. So what's the first thing we would do? We start again from the magnitude in dBs. And uh, uh, we look at limit cases because it makes our life easier. So the first limit case is say, okay, let's look at if omega is much smaller than omega n as we did before. This means that omega over omega n is much smaller than one, right? This means that if we look now at the magnitude, well, let me rewrite it. Now this term is much smaller than one, so it's negligible with respect to this. And this term goes to zero because it's much smaller than one, so it's gonna be negligible with respect to one as well. So this is roughly one in this case. So if we express the magnitude 
In dBs, though, we've got the usual tricky part of 20 logarithm and base 10 of 1, which is 0 dBs. Okay, so now let's express this, so omega as a function of omega n. Let's say that this is omega n. This is uh, 10 minus 1 omega n, and this is lower decades. This is 10 uh, at the power 1 omega n, and upper decades. This is 10 at the 0, basically. And uh, so what we're saying is that the magnitude is going to be 0 up to uh, much smaller a decade less than the natural frequency. Now let's look at uh, maybe what happens directly when uh, um, so what happens if instead the um, oh, let's look at the phase directly, then we'll go and do that later. So the phase is. Um, is this function here. Now we're making the case in which omega n is much, the ratio of the omegas is much smaller than one, so this part would be negligible with respect to one, and you've got the arc tangent of something that is going to zero because this term is very small over something that is one. So if you look at the tangent of something that goes to zero is zero. So at low frequencies with respect to the natural frequency, you've got a zero phase delay. Phase response, huh? oh again, this is 10 oh again, and so on. Now let's look at what happens when um, omega is much bigger than omega n. So we're basically trying to figure out what happens in the right side here. Well, in this case, uh, you can see that um, the magnitudes uh, are going to, let's look at the magnitudes. The magnitudes are going to be always this expression here is the magnitude. Um, we can uh, um, express this as basically uh, this term um, much bigger than one, so this term is going to be negligible with respect. So one is going to be negligible with respect to the squares here. Then this is a squared again, so this is going to be small with respect to this term here. So we've got, uh, if we express it in dBs, We've got 20 logarithm and base 10 of what? Of the um, basically root of uh, omega over omega n square square. The roots go away. This becomes 20 logarithm and base 10 of omega over omega n. And we can express it as square like this. Why? Because we like to, this, to take this coefficient and bring it in front. So this becomes 40 logarithm in base 10 of omega over omega n, which is equal to what? It's equal to 40 logarithm in base 10 of omega minus 40 logarithm in base 10 of omega n. So this means that at high frequencies, you see, note that this is twice as much as the gain as we had for the monomial term. And in fact, this makes a sense somehow, because if we take some particular case of this, for example, when the, uh, zeta is equal to zero, then uh, a, a, a squared term can be represented, the, the, the binomial term degenerates in being the square of a monomial term. So if the, it's like if you multiply two of the previous monomial terms that we saw, when you multiply in uh, the linear uh, domain, you're adding in the dBs. So if you had the thing growing at, we saw before for the monomial terms, we had a 20 dB per decade increase in the magnitude response. So if you imagine adding two of these together, you would expect it to grow at 40, which is exactly what we're getting here. So it means that at this spot, we get this going much higher, much uh, going higher, much faster at 40 dBs per decade. 
And uh, so we just approximate it like this for now. And let's look at the um, phase instead. So the phase in uh, of G of J omegas is going to be what? We said that in this case, uh, uh, omega over omega n, it's much bigger than 1. So what happens? Happens that if we look at the expression of the phase, well, then uh, this is much bigger than 1, so 1 is negligible. And uh, um, the, um, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at the case where we're going. Um, OK, so this means that this, uh, one sec. So we're looking at the phase, okay. So this, we have to look at this expression here. This will be the tangent inverse after approximation of basically uh, this guy will go to two zeta. And there's very little we can say about this like uh, this. And we have to sort of analyze the different conditions with respect to uh, uh, zeta. And uh, it turns out that the um, phase is going to tend to pi at if uh, zeta is, um, uh, no, it's going to tend to pi always, but depending on zeta, it's going to do it in different ways. It could be uh, the simple linear case like this when zeta is equal to 1 or it could be any way in between if we could be any way like this, or like this, or like this, or this is pi. And uh, this case here would be theta, theta equal to zero, to one, sorry. And the other extreme case like this would be theta, theta equal to zero. For the magnitudes instead, um, if we want to try and understand what happens when we are in proximity of the, um, of the natural frequency, so basically when omega is equal to omega n, we get magnitudes. So if omega is equal to omega n, it means this guy goes to 1. It means 1 minus 1 is 0. This term here goes to 1, so we've got... Um, the, um, so I think I did a mistake here because the J you know, omega is actually equal to 20 logarithm 10 of what stays out of here. So this goes to 1, this goes to 0, this goes to 1. It's the root of 4 zeta square, which is 2 zeta. This is wrong here. We'll fix it later. And uh, what happens? So if zeta equals to zero, you've got, so remember always the logarithm function. That's like this. This number here is one, zero. This is x. This is logarithm of x. So now we want to study what's going on here in this part of the, of the magnitude response. If zeta is equal to zero, it means that we're looking at this term here, okay? So the logarithm or the value in dBs actually gives a minus infinity uh, thing. So this is actually an asymptote, okay? In case that, and, and we can approximate it by just saying, okay, if we go from left to right, we just get this asymptotic behavior and we put like a small line. So in case of zeta equals being to zero, we can approximate the magnitude response like this. This would be zeta equal to zero. Now, if instead we take, uh, uh, for example, uh, zeta equals to 1, uh, we get 20 logarithm 10 of uh, 2. So this would be, it would be um, just 2 zeta. So it's... Um, it would behave like a, uh, in case of zeta equals being to zero, it would behave exactly like a monomial term, like this, 
squared, so summed up together. So from zero to the natural frequency, it would always be zero, and then it would uh, grow at twice the speed, as we said before. So this would go like this, and then eventually converge at, at this high rate up here after, and this, after the, 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 the one decade above omega n. So this is the case with zeta equals to zero, which is the square of a monomial term. Sorry, zeta equals to one. Now, what if we have anything in between? We can get all sorts of approximations that we can just uh, approximate like this. We take it linearly up to the uh, one decade above, and then we just say they converge towards, like, this has to go up here, and they all go up to 40 dB per decade. So this is the trickiest of the, of the, of the uh, terms, and uh, it depends on uh, the value of zetas. It can have this nasty asymptote that sort of makes everything complicated. And um, it, uh, of course, we are studying now the form directly like this. So it's as if we had the term at the numerator. If instead you bring it at the denominator, you have to put a minus in front of everything. And, um, and so how is all of this useful? All of this is useful because if we want to now look, for example, at a... Um, So let's go back to this. So you see that through our approximations, when we look at the integrator or derivator term, we, we have no approximation basically because it's, we, we can derive the exact uh, relationship. When we look, for example, at the monomial term, the, the binomial term, the one that represents a polar at zero, we said that we get a maximum error at the, at the uh, uh, time, the inverse of the time constant value. And here you can see the difference between the blue line, which is the approximator we came out of, the approximation we described, and the black line, which is the actual plot with MATLAB, the exact solution. <laughs> and it's not so far off neither for uh, magnitude nor phase. The maximum error in the magnitude, which would be this value here, is, uh, um, is 3 dBs. And in case of this uh, um, nastier term, you see that the phase, so here we're, this is the graph for when the term is at the denominator, so it's what we described that flipped over with a minus in front of it. Uh, the phase goes from zero at low frequencies to minus pi, and uh, the magnitude is exactly as the same shape as this is without, uh, with, a damp with a unit damping. Uh, it goes uh, twice as fast as the monomial term, so you'll see that every decade of the frequency here, you are actually going down of 40 dBs. And then if you just reanalyze everything in the, in, at the numerator, you just get the same stuff with a minus in front of it. And uh, so how is this useful? Um, this is useful because now somebody will come to you and say, okay, after doing all the possible um, uh, modeling my, my transfer function, getting some equations, and maybe coming up through some smart consideration with a controller, I write down my closed loop transfer function and I get something like this, okay, which is a bunch of terms. And somebody comes to you and says, okay, now design, write down, visualize this transfer function, let's, let's, let's plot it out. And uh, now that we know how each one of these terms behaves, we can uh, um, analyze them one by one. And uh, if G of S, is this, if we now look at the, the dB version of G of S, you've got uh, 20 times the logarithm of all of this, right? And the logarithm of the products of the numerator becomes the sum of the logarithms minus the sum of the, um, the, the terms at the denominator. So we can literally just write down the Bode plot for S plus two, which is after putting it in the right form, of course, you have, uh, it's a monomial term, then you have another monomial term, we write them down one by one, and then we can uh, literally put them one under the other and frequency by frequency sum up the contributions of each term in magnitude and in phase. So the phase part, the addition in the phase part can be done for free because if you take the 
um, arguments of these complex numbers, numerators and denominators of sum and subtract in the same way. And for the magnitudes, we get this behavior, the simplified behavior, just because we chose the dBs as an expression of the y-axis. And, uh, and so all this conversation boils down to uh, following fundamentally three steps. Get a transfer function, put it in Bode form, otherwise you will uh, do a mistake. Draw the terms for each, draw the Bode plots for each term, and then just add them all together. So it's, um, it's a little bit messy here, but the idea, let's follow it uh, one by one with the colors. So here, this is a, a, a term in the form one plus tau s, okay? Where tau is one half. So if you remember, the magnitude is at, at the numerator, is exactly as we showed it, with tau being a positive number. So the magnitude is zero from low frequencies up to one over tau. One over tau in this case is two. If you look at the frequency axis, 10 at the zero means one, right? So this is frequency one radian per second. And uh, in a logarithmic plane, each one of these, so these are decades, it means an order of magnitude. So this is one, this is two, this is, these, these dotted lines are two, three, four, and so on to 10. And then if this is 10, the next one is gonna be 100. So the dotted lines represent 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. So the one over tau here is two. And in fact, at this corner spot, it starts growing the magnitude for 20 dBs per decade. In a similar way, the green term does the same stuff because it's always the same term, just the tau is different. It's not uh, uh, one half, but it's one tenth. So the inverse will be 10. And in fact, this is one, this is 10, 10 to the power one. And at this point, it starts growing of, um, of 20 dBs per decade. Then we've got uh, one term that is constant over all frequencies, which is the, 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 the constant term. And uh, be very careful when you have this thing here, don't do this mistake. You, don't show, you know that if the constant term is positive, you have zero lag delay and uh, a constant gain among all frequencies, how it makes sense. But when you plot it here, you don't put two. You have to put the dBs of two. So it's 20 logarithm by 10 of two, whatever that number is, okay? And in fact, here it looks like to be something around six, seven, whatever it is. Now that we've done with the terms at the numerator, we can, okay, now we have, we have to look at the phases actually. So uh, we looked at these terms like this. We saw that the taus in this case are both positive. So the phases uh, grow up to pi half, 90 degrees, and they start growing at one decade before the corner frequencies. So in this case of the red term, we had one over two. The um, tau is equal to one over two, so one over tau is equal to two, so one decade less would be 0 0.2, and in fact, it's exactly where it starts here. So it goes, uh, the, the, the phase delay is zero up to here, then it starts going up, and then at one decade above the corner frequencies, it settles at 90 degrees, same behavior for the green term. Now let's look at the um, denominator terms. So note that it gets messy in the drawing, but actually, if you had a lot of patients, so the, if you would do this in an exam, you would be bringing, literally, you would print out the logarithmic paper, you would have pens with different colors so that it makes your life easy, and you would make each line independently, you would go and uh, uh, draw each one of these terms independently and hopefully not get confused when you have to sum them up. I'll show you how to sum them up later. Let's say, for example, it looks like one of these terms got confused, in fact, because one of these should be blue. But um, so let's look what happens here. We've got the simple term first, which is the monomial term uh, that has this behavior, zero, and it goes down 20 dBs per decade. And it's basically the same thing as the terms before, but just symmetric with respect to the x-axis. And the binomial term that instead grows at much higher rate and has bigger delay. So sorry for the delay, but the last thing is to get the final Bode plot. You just go frequency by frequency. So you take each point and you sum up all the contributions. You sum all the contributions of the denominator and you subtract the contributions of the denominator. So up to here, it would be all zeros and uh, just this minus term here. So you see you have a little bit, the real thing is starting to go down. 
And then piece by piece, with lots of patience, you just have to add all the contributions, and you get your final Bode plot. Your Bode diagram that looks, the black is the approximation, the blue would represent the real thing plotted out, and it's pretty decent. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions. <laughs>